How are you? I'm well. How are you? Okay. Okay. Starting to, starting to see sunlight. Starting to see sunlight. <laughs> All good. All right, Madam Chair. We're ready. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'd like to call the appropriate public hearing to order today. Or we have we have one bill and uh, one bill only. But I want to make sure that everybody um, has a chance to say their opening words if they would like. Um, let's see. Senator Austin's getting hot water, I think. Yep, she got hot water. Senator Austin, would you right like here. Say, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Uh, so good, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all. Today's hearing shouldn't take that long. So um, I, I welcome uh, all of the APROPS committee, the APROPS staff, and the various agencies that will be speaking to us today. And good afternoon, Madam Secretary. Good afternoon, Senator. Senator, was that a, was that a plea or a statement of fact? <laughs> Sounded more like a plea to me, didn't it? Sound like you took representative friends. That was a it, that was a beg on her part, huh? It did sound had that tone to it. I, I would agree with you, <laughs> Madam Chair. <laughs> would, good, would you like to greet everybody in the committee, sir? Or thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Welcome everybody to uh, appropriations. Welcome to the back to the committee. Welcome, Madam Secretary. I look forward to the testimony of all to look at the deficiency bill and understand uh, the substance of it and the rationale, but. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. And I was looking to see if my good friend, Senator Minor was on. He said he might be a little late. So I'm sure when he gets on, he'll make a, a, a greetings also. So with that, I would like uh, to begin this hearing. Um, first, we have Secretary McCall and others. <laughs> so I, if you'd like to just introduce your, your team, that are on the call today, and then we go from there. Go right ahead, Madam. Great. Well, good afternoon to you, Representative Walker, Senator Austin, and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. I am joined here today by several members of the OPM team, and um, I can see that we have our Executive Budget Officer, Paul Patamianos. Um, I imagine that somewhere uh, there is probably our assistant EBO, Greg Messner. Uh, Judith Dowd oversees our Health and Human Services section, um, and I, we might have a few other section directors that are here today that I do not see on our screen. And so with that, first I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on House Bill 6438, an act making deficiency appropriations for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. Um, this bill, as you are aware, uh, would provide deficiency appropriations, which in combination with FAC or adjustments of pullbacks would fully address any shortfalls for the current fiscal year as projected by the Office of Policy and Management as of January 20th, 2021. Um, as in prior years, obviously our projections do change on a monthly basis and they have indeed changed since January. Mm -hmm. um, our latest comptroller's report is dated March 19th we will continue to work with the Office of Fiscal Analysis and the Appropriations Committee to make the appropriate adjustments to reflect the updated estimates. And the bill that is before you today, um, as proposed and as based on our estimates as of January, uh, would provide for appropriations totaling $70 million for agencies that uh, had de deficiencies um, as of January. Uh, reductions in appropriations are proposed to ensure that there's no net change to the general fund budget and to ensure that our adjusted mm -hmm. fiscal year 2021 budget would remain $5 million under the spending cap unchanged from uh, the budget as adopted. Section one proposes general fund appropriations totaling $70 million uh, for the agencies that are detailed in uh, the testimony. The table also provides a second column, which gives you our latest estimates for these respective agencies. It does tie to the March uh, 2021 uh, uh, comptroller's letter. Um, and it also includes some additional descriptions explaining the shortfalls and any anticipated offsetting lapses um, as well. Section two, uh, deappropriates $70 million in the general fund from the Department of Social Services Medicaid line item in order to maintain balance and cap compliance. 
um, after the uh, proposed efficiency appropriations are made. This deappropriation um, is achievable primarily because of the enhanced uh, Medicaid match that we received as a result of the public health pandemic. Um, as a result of, of these additional uh, resources um, that were part of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, uh, this has reduced the state's share of program costs under Medicaid by about $295 million in the current fiscal year. And then finally, Section 3 clarifies that the deficiency appropriation for the University of Connecticut Health Center um, would not be eligible for additional fringe benefit recovery without this language, an additional 53 million uh, in general fund resources would need to be made available to support fringe benefit costs. So we've included language to ensure that uh, the projected deficiency um, would total the exact, the amount that was estimated as of January um, and would not result in additional uh, fringe related expenses. Uh, with that, um, I, as you know, we have agency representatives that will be here today to submit testimony specific to their shortfalls, and I'll be happy to take your questions as well. I, I do want to spend a little time addressing the $25 million that uh, is projected for potential additional COVID testing requirements. Uh, many of us, we are all aware that our testing program has made Connecticut a leader across the nation in combating the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have been very successful in leveraging available federal funds to support our comprehensive testing program. One of our most uh, flexible sources of funds is the Coronavirus Relief Fund, uh, which is essentially fully committed to date. We, to date, we did commit $305 million towards testing efforts. We've braided together multiple funding sources to support the testing for our community testing program, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, correction state employees. This is a $431 million expense for the state. And based on a number of federal funding streams that have been available, I do anticipate that there'll be a shortfall of approximately $25 million. So therefore uh, that amount has been reflected in our latest estimates. Um, again, we stand ready to work with OFE and the Appropriations Committee to revise the bill to reflect our latest updates. Um, and as you have experienced in prior years, any actions that we may need to take in the May or June FAC um, meetings might, um, might be necessary to address timing of availability of funds so agencies can address their operational needs. With that, I just, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to present testimony and um, I'm available for any questions that we can assist you with. Thank you, thank you, Madam Secretary, and thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm going to remind everybody, we're going to start with the two question rules so that we, we don't, and please, senators, do not try to slide in a third, please. Um, I, I'm going to ask a couple of sort of school questions because I know people are still struggling with what is a lapse, what is um, a deficiency, and um, what is a holdback. So could you just explain each one of them? very slow and carefully so that everybody doesn't immediately call us later and say, now what is a lapse and what is a holdback? Absolutely. So a lapse is um, our unspent dollars. If the legislature appropriated $100,000 for a program and uh, the projected expense is only 80,000, then you would see a projected lapse or unspent dollars or surplus, if you will, of $20,000. Um, deficiency would be that the amount appropriated is not adequate. We're projecting that expenses will exceed the appropriated levels for um, a particular line item or SID, as we would uh, call it in our technical speak. Um, and finally, a holdback when the legislature adopts a budget and passes a budget, there are a series of bottom line um, savings. So for example, uh, hiring, uh, salary-related savings. Uh, our current budget had pension-related savings, which were negotiated and achieved, uh, healthcare-related savings. And those savings are reflected um, as a, a, a negative number in the budget that's approved and off the Office of Policy and Management, therefore has to apply those holdbacks to the appropriations throughout the state budget. Um, and so uh, at the beginning of every fiscal year prior to July 1, 
uh, we review the line items and the intent of the holdbacks, and we will then uh, take, for example, take our, our pension uh, appropriation and we will reflect or hold back, not a lot, not provide to the agencies for spending um, a certain amount of funds that would be in anticipation of uh, negotiated savings. So essentially a hold back means the amount appropriated um, will, the amount we actually provide to the agencies will be less than the appropriation by the hold back. And, and those are um, items that are provided to the administration to execute uh, consistent with the budget that you, you adopt. And I hope somebody asked for um, the difference between a lapse and a, and a holdback a little bit more specifically, but I'll leave that alone. Now, under the budget, we have a cap. Lapse, holdback, and deficiency, do all three of them have an impact on the cap in the budget? Yes. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the overall uh, budgeted amount, whether you adjust it through any bill, still has to comply with a maximum level of appropriation and that level of appropriation has to adhere to the spending cap. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I started a conversation just for, just for the purpose of people learning. Um, Senator Austin. I have no questions. Okay, uh, all right, let me go to my... Uh -huh. I got too many, too many computers and too many mice. Uh, <laughs> Representative Abercrombie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Secretary McCaw. So nice to see you today. Great to see you as well. So just two quick questions. Um, on the lapses, are there any areas of the budget that fall outside of the cap? So the spending, uh, Representative Abercrombie, the spending cap applies to the to the appropriated funds. So general fund, banking fund, workers compensation fund. Um, we we do have other funds that come in that um, are not a part of appropriated funds. They're not relative to any of the items that we are discussing here today. Um, for the most part, the most significant uh, revenues or expenses that we rely on to administer. Um, our state programs are a part of the spending cap. So um, today we're focusing on appropriated funds, a general fund and special transportation fund. And yes, they are subject to the spending cap. So just, just to be clear for our colleagues. So if any of these items that, none of the items that are currently um, under the deficiency bill have to do with Medicaid, which means they all fall under the spending cap. But isn't it true that the Medicaid funding is outside of the spending cap? No, that is not true. So Medicaid, all of Medicaid falls under the spending cap? Yes. The items we have before us today, um, as far as deficiencies, have no relationship to Medicaid. We do propose, so it, in order to appropriate new dollars, since we're only $5 million below the spending cap, our, our total appropriations, we will have to find areas where there's lapse or underspending so we can appropriate new dollars and deappropriate elsewhere. Medicaid has a significant lapse, as you know, Representative Abercrombie, because of the additional uh, matching funds that have come from the federal government as a part of uh, stimulus relief. Okay, thank you, Madam Secretary. And then my second question is, can you speak a little bit to the $70 million under the DSS? Which pocket of money is that? Again, I heard you mention the 295. Is that 295 million? Is that the 6.2 increase in Medicaid? That is correct. The enhanced FMAP provided us with an additional 6.2 percentage points. So that resulted in 295 million of expenditure savings in Medicaid. In the deficiency bill, we proposed to take $70 million of those savings and use that to cover the shortfalls in other agencies. So is that 295 million above the 450 million that was the lapse in the DSS Medicaid budget? No, it's inclusive. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, next we have, oh my, next we have uh, Representative Dayton. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and nice to see you today. Um, oh, you've jumped around the screen for me. Um, <laughs> nice to see you today, uh, Madam right. Commissioner. Um, just wanted to double check that when you use the term shortfall in your testimony, you are also referring to a deficiency because it seems like you use the two terms interchangeably. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, great. So um, I also wanted to know in terms of your kind of financial analysis that you do on lapses and holdbacks, do you have an analysis of these that you do by agency and um, maybe uh, also by functionality in terms of like, we, we heard a lot in our presentations about personnel cost and a lot of times it was due to uh, not hiring of individuals. And um, I'm just trying to kind of get a, a, an overall big picture do we um, have an analysis by agency as well as by functionality of expense? Uh, Representative Dathan, great to see you today. We conduct a monthly uh, financial analysis for every department, for every agency, for every appropriated line item. So personal services is a specific appropriation for salary related expenses. And so, yes, there is a agency by agency analysis conducted on a monthly basis. And the comptroller's letter would be updated for areas where we believe um, a deficiency will materialize. And as we get closer to the end of the year, it becomes a little um, more laser sharp as to whether or not a shortfall will materialize. And, and we obviously, um, we look at your other line items that might have savings or lapses and whether or not we can address some of those issues through the FAC transfer process, which only allows you to transfer within an agency or whether or not we will ultimately need a deficiency uh, bill appropriation to resolve um, the shortfall or the deficit for a given agency. And my second question is, what is the uh, methodology used by OPM to determine if a lapse or a holdback will become permanent and therefore not budgeted in future financial periods? So the holdback analysis process occurs on an annual basis, and the methodology differs based on the type of account. So if it is a salary-related account, um, obviously we'll take a look at what their current filled uh, headcount is, um, is and, and, and run the numbers and what it costs to maintain current payroll along with um, anticipated vacancies. Um, other accounts, we might look at spending trends. Uh, we also look historically at uh, levels of spending. So for example, if an account has had a you know $20,000 holdback for the past 10 years and it was appropriated 100,000, well, that program effectively has been functioning on $80,000 and we can maintain operations. So it's varied um, depending on the type of program or the, or the type of account. We start that process every June after uh, the budget is enacted or the, uh, the budget is adjusted. Um, and we, uh, we, you know, so it could change year, year to year depending on the needs of the agency, the changes in the program, um, et cetera. So you have a schedule of all these um permanent holdbacks already? Is they are the not, per, they're not permanent because you could choose to change the holdbacks. As you finalize the upcoming biennial budget, uh, you could decide that the hiring savings um, holdback or, uh, or bottom line lapse that you include in, in, the, uh, in the adopted budget, that it could be lower or higher. And therefore you are, uh, OPM is then required to goal seek, if you will, or identify how we could achieve those savings. Um, and so we you typically uh, in the final budget include a, a number of different types of holdbacks. And then we will evaluate on an annual basis where we think we can apply those holdbacks in a way that um, doesn't significantly harm the integrity of the programs or the legislative intent um, or areas of priority of the legislature or the executive branch. So it, it really is, um, they're not permanent in nature. It, it really does require an annual review. Okay, thank you so much. I could go on, but I'm gonna stop because I've asked my two questions. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank, thank, thank you. you, Madam. I just wanna point out to my good colleagues, the, the, the two representatives, y'all asked four questions, but that's okay. I wasn't counting. <laughs> that's all right. Um, Re Representative Fran. Oh, I'm sorry, Wait. Representative Dillon. Oh, no. Um, what happened? Representative 
France, I think, was next. So that's who I saw last. I'm sorry. Representative France. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. For, uh, so Madam Secretary, for your uh, testimony. First, first question I have is in your letter of March 19th, you projected shortfalls of almost $188 million, and yet we're only dealing with $70 million in this deficiency request. Um, what is what is the rationale for not dealing with the entire shortfall projected in your letter? Uh, and what is your plan for dealing with the remainder of that money? Thank you, Representative France. Great to see you today. Uh, Representative House Bill 6438 was submitted at the time the governor proposed uh, his biennial budget, um, as we do customarily and as required. And it, ref it re actually reflects the deficiencies that were projected as of January of this year. Um, and those numbers change. They change as, the, as we monitor trends um, or updated estimates are received from the agencies. So standard procedure is as we get closer to a deficiency bill actually being um, heard and voted upon, OPM and OFA will work to update the, defic the deficits and update the bill to reflect our most current projected shortfall. So that it's really a timing issue, that's all. I guess a follow-up to so the plan, what is the plan to deal with the other roughly $110 million that's not included if you, you know, you said mentioned an update to the bill, why wasn't it amended to include these other deficiencies and what's your plan to deal with them? Sure, so um, the $187.8 million, um, mm -hmm. there are a couple of areas where, first of all, embedded in there. One, I would note that there's about $30 million that is uh, projected for adjudicated claims. The budget does not carry an appropriation for that line item. These uh, settlement related costs are deemed appropriated from the resources of the journal fund. So that naturally occurs. And then there are two other large line items. One is in the state employees health service cost. That's about a $28.2 million shortfall, which is really driven by um, some of the contractual savings we were negotiating, the, that process got delayed due to COVID. And so the amount of the savings came, is coming in a little bit lower this year. Um, one tool, we could release um, a portion of the holdback to address that $28.2 million. Uh, similarly, in the state employees retirement contributions for our um, the UAL, the unfunded accrued liability for our pension related costs, we are projecting a $41 million deficit. That is due to an updated valuation and the fact that we were unable to have uh, take action on, on the midterm budget. So that was proposed to be addressed. Um, so that shortfall could also be addressed through a release of holdback. So those three line items alone are $99.2 million. Um, so the next steps that typically occur um, would be that OPM and OFA would uh, work on which of the items in the 187 million need to be addressed in a deficiency bill versus other mechanisms like release of holdback or whether or not we have an opportunity to transfer through the FAC process. The numbers get clearer as you get closer to April um, and May. And so therefore we don't typically amend the bill between January and, and April, May. We work collaboratively with, with OFA um, as both of our projections are becoming clear and they, and they typically, the numbers that we're estimating begin to align. Um, so the, the plan um, for any remaining deficiencies, we have more than adequate um, excess or lapse or surplus in Medicaid um, and we would deappropriate the amount needed to fund the deficiencies and we deappropriate for Medicaid. Well, thank you for that, uh, that clarification and answer. Appreciate that. Uh, second question, deals with the addressing the, the $25 million for the COVID testing. I think you mentioned in your testimony, it was approximately $431 million of total expense uh, of federal money, but it would still leave a shortfall. Does that include the additional money that came to the state under the American Rescue Plan and the latest amount of dollars that came to the state? Um, so it does not include the state fiscal relief funds that came through the ARPA. Um, those dollars we are still awaiting guidance on. I do expect that testing cost will be an eligible expense because it's clearly related to the pandemic. Um, however, 
uh, as you really call the governor's budget and, and, and you're working on finalizing your budget does assume that 1.75 billion of the 2.6 billion we're getting through that state local fiscal relief funding um, would be used for revenue replacement or eligible expenditures to balance the budget. We're still going to need to continue our, our testing program. Um, our, our nursing homes, assisted living facilities, our entire community testing program um, is, is, is funded at the state level. And we anticipate expenses that could be up to $260 million next fiscal year. Uh, so I believe the best course is for us to close out the cost for the current fiscal year um, and utilize our ARPA dollars to fund the testing that we'll need to get through the next year. There, I will note also in response to your question that there were very limited funds provided directly to DPH for testing. There was only one particular allocation and it is specific to K-12 testing. And I believe that was around $107 million. Our K-12 testing is a very small cost within um, even this year's $400 million program and next year's approximately $200 million program. So the feds really limited us by putting such a narrow scope. They didn't provide other direct resources to DPH um, that are broad testing related. So we're gonna, we will propose in the governor's allocation plan to um, utilize some of the dollars to keep the testing program going through the next year. So limit, limited funding resources on testing. So if I understand what you're saying, the roughly $900 million delta between the what is allocated in the budget and the total amount provided under ARP, uh, there is insufficient funds there to uh, pay for the additional $25 million that you're proposing to come out of the, the general fund. Is that essentially what you're saying if I boil it down? Yes, I, I believe it will be stretched. And, and I'm sure that... Um, there will be a lot of priorities on your side as well that need to be addressed through the, those funds as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Representative Dillon. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, um, Commissioner, and thank you very much for your hard work. It's good to see you. Um, and um, and I, I, I guess I want to thank Representative France for some of his questions because they covered some territory. So. Uh, I, I want to just to identify some, in some places, maybe the connection between policy and budgeting, and that is two of the departments before us, the medical examiners and mental health and addiction, uh, there have been issues with retaining clinicians. So this has been a chronic issue in the medical examiner's office that long predated your tenure, so I'm, I'm not doing that. But, um, and, and some of it uh, in, in mental health and addiction as well, we see a pattern of lapsing dollars um, of using the professional services account to pay for clinicians who ordinarily one might expect to uh, see in the PS account. Um, has there been a review of compensation of clinicians within your administration to try to look, because just as I'm, I'm concerned that let's say playing, paying people on an ad hoc basis may interrupt continuity of care for the vulnerable, but also it may cost more. I don't really know. We haven't unpacked that. Is there a plan in place to review the pay paid to the clinicians in state service? Representative Dillon, thank you for the question. Great to see you today. Indeed, yes, there is um, our, my, uh, the Office of Policy and Management's Office of Labor Relations. Um, recently, I tasked them with doing a market analysis uh, of the areas where we struggle are in our nurses and doctors. We do have contractual provisions that allow us to provide uh, retention and recruitment bonuses um, for our nurses, for our doctors. Um, their, the amount is higher if it is a second or third shift assignment, um, but we, we are still observing that attracting uh, the, the individuals at our current salary levels um, remains a challenge. So there is a uh, benchmarking uh, that is occurring right now, looking at private sector rates, as well as even within state government. If you look at some of the nursing salaries at UConn Health, um, they're higher. And so 
um, we're going to have to determine what's the appropriate level to, to level the playing field and ensure that we have a, an attractive wage. That work is underway. Um, we are doing so in partnership with DOC and DEMIS so that uh, in addition to the efforts they have to significantly recruit that we can actually have, um, we can have salaries that that attract the employees. This might require a hiring rate type adjustment and, and some um, agreements with our, our partners in labor. But the work is underway, yes, so that we can have a longer term strategy to address some of the salary concerns that are holding us back with effectively refilling the positions. Thank you very much. And, and I guess my second question, because some of the, the uh, uh, lapse issues has I think been addressed. Going forward, given uh, sticking just to me mental health really, so it would, it would, it would ripple throughout our department agencies. There's significant evidence that post COVID um, folks have significant anxiety, depression, and they act out in all kinds of ways, which could affect criminal justice. It could affect utilization um, of services by our state employee health system. I really don't know. Um, is there, um, are you aware or is there an ongoing effort to try to plan sort of as we pivot towards how we, how we continue to bring our state back uh, into, into a forward thinking position, how we anticipate caring for the people who have significant issues post COVID, including mental health? Representative, the answer is a resounding yes. Um, we're, we're hearing it, whether it's in the community with individuals that have been impacted by unemployment losses, our parents, the children that the demands for additional mental health supports have increased. And so as we think about how to recover in the next year or two, it's not just from an economic perspective, but it's also from the perspective of what additional service supports do we need to provide. So you will see uh, the governor will be recommending as a part of um, our, uh, as a part of his plan for the state fiscal recovery funds, additional supports. Um, in addition, there were some direct allocations provided to the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. There's a substance abuse um, and mental health uh, grant, uh, additional funds that came through ARPA uh, that will also be available to help bolster uh, some of our general fund spending in this area. So yes, we, we recognize this as a need and you will see that as a part of his recommended plan back to the legislature. Thank you, and, and a, a quick comment that um, so one of the hardest hit groups is eight to 13, which is well below the age group uh, cared for by Demas and which it is not necessarily DCF, they're, they're, they're everywhere. And, uh, and so I hope that we have a robust plan to to focus on on the younger people too, and thank you very very much. It's been it's been a tough year for everyone, and I appreciate all your work. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, thank you, Representative. Um, I just want to let everybody know that in in uh, Secretary McCarr's testimony, she has the um, she has the the layout for uh, the uh, January deficiency, which is 5 fill 6438, but she also has a column next to it that shows as of the 319 letter what the deficiencies are. And also remind you that um, an Office of Fiscal Analysis is on their website too, so you can get all of these and any of these materials. Hey, Anna. So, Maria. Uh, Senator Flex, do you have a question or can we mute you? Oh. Muter. Um, but anyhow, are there any uh, any questions, uh, Representative Betts? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and, and thank you very much uh, for your testimony today. A lot of us. I just want to follow up on Representative Dillon. A lot of us are looking at the mental health issue is not a two year issue, but more of a permanent substantive need for at least five years. And uh, I'm wondering if the governor, and I know he was gonna be putting some additional resources in this, 
I'm wondering if there's some specific goals such as hiring X number of psychiatrists or putting in a, a significant amount of money for better coordination and access for mental health services, regardless of people's age. It's really based on need and how to work that so that the hospitals don't continually get overwhelmed with these kind of situations. I know it's outside the deficiency, but I, it's hard to not consider that that problem is going to be real and large unless we really look at the deficiency and say, we're going to put more here, but we're committed to not just doing it for the deficiency, but for the years in the future. Representative, um, you, you raise a good point and I, I don't want to uh, preview too much of some of the work that you'll be seeing on April 26, but there is an opportunity to look at expanding um, mobile crisis mental health services. Uh, the bill that passed uh, in Washington did provide enhanced um, Medicaid match um, for uh, as a mechanism to, to bring more mental health support out on the scene when, when it's needed. Um, we are always outside of a budget process working on policy challenges. And another area that we're focused on is children's behavioral health and opportunities to expand capacity um, and address some of the, the backlogs in that system. So I do look forward to briefing you on some of the administration's thoughts in this area. Um, it certainly is an area of concern and it will be an area of focus uh, when the governor releases his plan on April 26th for your consideration. Well, thank you. That's very reassuring. And, and as we all said, mental health is not a bipartisan is not a partisan issue. It's a real human need. It's one of those few areas that I would say is the responsibility for the state government to take a lead. And uh, it's encouraging. It sounds like we're all coming together on that because I do think it's urgent, and I do think time is of the essence. So, thank you very much for that, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions from any members of the committee for the secretary? Are there any other questions? Huh. No, ma'am. You did a good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Great to be here. Good to see you again. Good to see good you. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we have uh, Joseph Jeremiah from the Capital Regional Development Authority. Um, with the DEC Coming in right now, Madam Chair. DECD staff. Okay, hello. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Good, how are you? This is uh, Kyle. Um, so good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Senator Minor, Representative France, and members of the Appropriations Committee. I am Kyle Abercrombie, Director of Government Affairs for the Department of Economic and Community Development. With me today from DECD is Cheryl Bokwinski, our Fiscal Administrative Supervisor, and Kathy Woodward, our Fiscal Administrative Manager. And then we also have Joseph Jeremiah and Anthony Lazaro, the CFO and Deputy CFO of CRDA. So on behalf of Commissioner Lehman, uh, we are here to support uh, House Bill 6438, an act making deficiency appropriations for the fiscal year ending on June 30th, 2021. You have our testimony and I would like to just hand it over to Joseph and Anthony to discuss the importance of CRDA and the appropriations contained in this bill. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. And when I looked up, I was like, wow, David's changed. Go, um, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Joseph, are you there? Kyle, is he with us? I'm just looking. He may be calling him from his cell, I, Madam Chair, so let me um, allow him to talk. I, I see him uh, here. Oh, at the very end. I see him at the very end, I think. You see him? Maybe that's him on the um, 1860. Is that him? You would just have to unmute. Good, af good afternoon, Senators and Representatives. Am I unmuted now? Uh, yeah, are you Joseph? Yes, this is Joseph Jeremiah. 
Go ahead. Go right ahead, sir. Okay, good afternoon, senators and representatives. We submitted some testimony and I'd like to summarize it for you um, today. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss our status of the appropriations, both allocated to and being spent by CRDA. Uh, as many of you know, we were created in 2012 <clears throat> and tasked with a variety of responsibilities. Um, one of them being managing the state's large entertainment and sports venue including the Connecticut Convention Center, Pratt and Whitney Stadium at Renter Field, and the Excel Center. Um, the, the authority receives appropriations uh, to drive downtown economic activities. These venues uh, operate generally at a deficit, and then they produce tax revenues that come back into the general fund. The Convention Center um, annually runs a deficit of approximately two and a half million and produces around four million in state tax generation, the Excel Center um, having a deficit of around two million and then produces a couple, two million in state tax generation. We ended last year, last fiscal year, with some unfunded operating losses amounting to 800,000 at the Convention Center, uh, 800,000 at Brian Whitney Stadium and about 950,000 at the Excel Center. As the COVID pandemic shut down these facilities, all of the revenues from events ceased, and we initiated a number of activities um, to alleviate these cash concerns, being either reducing staff to a minimum operating level to maintain and secure the buildings, uh, eliminating or suspending available maintenance agreements. We negotiated fee concessions with our management companies, and then we transferred funds from a garage that we also operate to offset expenses at the Excel Center. However, even with these measures in place, the physical structures themselves still need to be continually maintained and upkeep, which we have um, need of additional funds that we're requesting today. They, these venues also have some major activities booked for the coming months where we would like to reopen in the, in the early fall with conventions and conferences a gymnastics national tour event at the Excel Center, and also an NCAA lacrosse championship at Pratt and Whitney Stadium. Um, at the at the current moment, there's also a number of COVID-related activities we're performing on behalf of the state at the convention center. We are running a vaccination site that sees nearly a thousand residents per day. We have a COVID testing site um, on site in one of our garages and the exhibit hall is set up as an overflow hospital with 600 beds. Pratt Whitney Stadium is operating a drive-through testing site, a drive-through food distribution site for residents, and also hosting a mass vaccination site at the former airfield. Uh, thank you allow, Thank you for allowing me to present our testimony today. And um, Mr. Lazaro and myself are happy to answer any questions that you, know, you may have or may be of interest of the members. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Um, are there any questions from any of the members of the committee? Uh -huh. Representative Davis. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you, Joseph, for your um, your description today. Um, I just wanted to clarify um, for the um, CRDA, what was the fiscal year 18 and 19 actuals um, for this? And did we envision going, sorry, that will that'll be my first question. I'm not trying to run into more than one question. Thank you. Uh, 18 and 19, we had um, approximately the convention center receives um, two and a half, $2.8 million per year in appropriations dollars. The Excel Center generally receives 600,000 in appropriation dollars. The, um, the Pratt and Whitney Stadium differs. Um, it doesn't receive direct appropriation dollars. Um, those, uh, that funding flows through OPM, but generally it requires approximately 600 to 900,000 per year in, uh, in state support dollars. 
um, I, I didn't add up all those numbers, but um, were the uh, appropriations in 18 and 19 consistent with what was appropriated in fiscal year 20? It sounded similar, but I just didn't add up the, do the dollars quickly. Yeah, the appropriation uh, rep rep representative for 20 is similar to 18 and 19. The difference is that in when COVID, when the COVID pandemic hit in March of 20, um, the last three and a half months for these venues um, eliminated all re all outside revenue sources. So these venues don't operate just on appropriation dollars. Right. Uh, I, venues open. So, yeah. So that you. entire source of yeah. So my second question is: Do we envision? Um, outside of COVID, if we get back to sort of normal life, when we get back to normal life, do we envision that fiscal year 20, um, you know, ongoing outside of uh, COVID money that would be needed, do we feel like the uh, ongoing appropriations are adequate? It'll, I could answer by saying that in fiscal year 21 is what we're having, what we're dealing with right now, right. being closed all year. Next, but no, I was thinking year, about ongoing 22 and 23. Yeah. For for fiscal year 22, they'll be similar to what we experienced in fiscal year 20 because we're going to be significantly op reopening these venues on September 1st. So we'll go through the first quarter mm -hmm. with these venues being undone. Once we hit fiscal year 23, the event loads uh, start to become um, normal again, more like 18, 19. So then it would be um, then it would go back to normal appropriations, and I think those are significant, are are uh, appropriate. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions, uh, Representative France? Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you just for being here. Uh, just want one question related to the you know, pandemic services that you're providing uh, through CRDA. Are you receiving uh, reimbursement through the federal money that has come to the state for those services to make you whole for the service you're providing? Um, yes, so Representative France, we're receiving partial reimbursements for the services we're providing. Under the COVID Relief Fund Act, um, we are allowed to receive reimbursement for any, any personnel or expenses directly related to COVID operations that were unbudgeted for. So therefore any staff or expenses that we incur were being reimbursed by CRF funds, which um, decreased the amount of deficit funding we're requesting from you. However, what it doesn't, it is only for unbudgeted positions. So any type of management position or any type of maintenance agreement that, that we had in the building that was budgeted already are unavailable for that type of reimbursement. Um, which is the significant uh, request, the, the, the expenses that basically are, are being asked of through this deficiency funding bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, and I just want to follow up on what you, you just talked about with Representative France. So the, the expenses that you are seeking funding for here are expenses that are outside of your reimbursement from... Um, OPM for um, for Corona Relief Fund. That's correct, Representative. And the, and the, the, not, those things were not were they planned or were they were they things that happened because of what was going on? No, none of none of the COVID uh, related activities that we are um, participating in for F FY twenty one were planned. Um, as as the budget for that was already done before uh, COVID hit. Um, however, if any, if these venues had budgeted staff or budgeted maintenance fees and were continuing to have them to operate the facility, mm -hmm. those expenses are uneligible for CRF funds. But don't they don't they fall under lost revenues? Don't don't yeah, under the, the CRF funds. Um, you are allowed to use, I thought, the funding for any lost revenues. You cannot supplant 
but to if you have a, a loss of revenue that can be expense, I thought those were allowable. No, so that's that's why that's the difficulty these venues are having that um, CRF reimburses based on expenses. It will not reimburse on any type of lost revenue projection. Okay, but the American Rescue will. Correct. We looked at a portion. We looked at a portion of the American Rescue Act with dealing mm -hmm. with venues, mm -hmm. and after looking at that, um, the CRGA venues are not eligible for those. Because, um, primarily, um, a, a few prongs. One being a a state agency. Secondly, um, the fact that our venues aren't our primary form of business, and we we do other. Uh, activities beside venue make, uh, management. And then lastly, there's some issues with either buildings not have convention center not having permanent seating or the fact that at the Excel Center, more than 50% of our revenues come from sporting events. I see. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you for, for, um, for coming and test. Oh. Representative, Representative Betts. Betts. Yeah, Representative thank, Betts. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your testimony. But I want to follow up with uh, Representative Walker because I may uh, have a misunderstanding as to what you're eligible for um, reimbursement. I just want to see if I'm wrong. Please let me know. But are you saying that the lost revenue that would have been realized had you been able to play in the Excel Center and the other field, the other sporting events, they were canceled. Are they? Are you saying that you're not eligible under any of these programs to replace that lost revenue, even though they were contracts to to play in those sites? Correct, Representative. These programs don't reimburse for lost revenues and don't get into um, the arguments back and forth of what would a lost revenue be. They are strictly to reimburse for expenses that deal with. Um, managing the activities for COVID. It's strictly but, an expense reimbursement. But aren't businesses that lose revenue because of COVID, are they not eligible mm -hmm. and qualified in receiving, if they apply, mm -hmm. receiving federal reimbursement, particular, for example, like with uh, restaurants or manufacturing? Or am I just, I'm unclear, I'm really confused as to why you would not be eligible for it or why you stand outside the other groups. Could you help me understand that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, do, I mean, I would be, uh, it, it would be my own opinion. I believe that the lost revenue calculation would be too speculative to have the federal government confirm that um, to be able to reimburse based on that type of calculation. In terms of restaurants or other businesses, I haven't read the policies uh, for them, but I know regarding the functions that we've um, that we have put on regarding our COVID um, relief um, activities, they are, and the CRF fund specifically, they, are, they only reimburse for expenses with um, put out. They do not reimburse um, or get into any type of calculations on the lost revenues. Okay, well, let me just wrap up by saying, um, I wonder what goes on nationally if there are other areas in other states that have sporting events or concert events or different sites for different things that they've annually always planned for. Does that apply to all the, I'm not trying to put you in a position of this, but it, it strikes me as if no other, none of the other similar sites in any of the other states were getting reimbursed. Am I right to infer that? I'm not trying to put you in a difficult spot, but I'm really having a difficult time comprehending where the reimbursement was going. I can't really, I, like you were saying, I really can't answer that based on other ones. I, I being us being an agency who manages the, manages the facility, but also does other types of activities such as housing and downtown economic development. The, any type of um, program or COVID relief programs from the federal government, there's no others that CRGA or their venues are eligible to receive, um, except for the CRF funds that we're receiving 
directly for the COVID-related activities we're performing. Okay, thank you very much, Joseph, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and um, I, I, I want to look, in, look into um, what you think are the limitations, because I think some of us have heard different things, and I thought towns were allowed to collect on lost revenues in some of their venues, so um, I think um, we'll follow up with you on that. So thank you very much, sir, for your testimony, and um, have a good day. Thank you, committee. Okay. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. James Gill from the Office of Chief Medical Examiner. Dr. Gill? Yep. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, sir. Would you go right ahead? Uh, so, I'm the Chief Medical Examiner, James Gill. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm here to uh, uh, discuss our uh, projected total deficiency of uh, just under $500,000 in personal services uh, related to our uh, increased work uh, during the past year uh, involving uh, um, COVID, uh, increased uh, deaths due to drug intoxication deaths and um, homicides. Um, and uh, I'm you know, willing to take any questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that, that very brief and direct uh, testimony. <laughs> Are there any questions um, for the good, good doctor? I, I quickly, um, in your in your uh, budget, and we noticed that you were looking for a, another doctor. Um, the question was, and I've heard this a couple of times. Uh, the question is, with Getting the new doctor for you, your for this, the office of chief medical examiner, does that help you, or does it not impact your accreditation? Uh, it would impact our accreditation. Right now, we're approaching almost um, three thousand uh, autopsies a year, uh, and if you kind of crunch the numbers, uh, our doctors are going to be doing too many. Um, uh, and so uh, we need uh, that that tenth doctor uh, to help us. Okay, so it, it would be a benefit to help you with, to maintain your accreditation. Okay, just, just wanted to make sure on that one. I guess there's nobody has a question. So with that, I thank the you. David for, Wilson oh, has a question. David Wilson has a question? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, there we go, Representative Wilson. Representative Wilson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm sorry, I did have my hand raised. I don't know um, why you couldn't see it, but anyway. Um, and uh, Dr. Gill, um, good to see you. Um, just uh, wanted to take a second and, and say, uh, uh, it's nice to see you there uh, uh, as a former uh, Litchfield resident. Uh, I know your folks are, are very proud of you. Um, and I do have your testimony up here and I, and I have read it. Um, and the, it just, uh, uh, begs to me a couple of questions. Very interesting, 30% increase in homicides, 13% increase in uh, drug intoxication deaths. Um, and then uh, in uh, your second to last sentence, you say you do not expect the number of death investigations to decrease and see continued challenges in the future. Um, and I wonder how that ties to COVID. So in other words, if, if uh, COVID ends or, or becomes uh, more contained and controlled, um, uh, are you projecting uh, that, for example, uh, the homicides and the drug deaths are, are, are gonna continue to rise? Yeah, it's difficult for me to predict. I think with, with COVID decreasing, we'll, we're certainly going to see a decrease in, for example, the number of cremations that we uh, investigate. Uh, over the past year, the number of cremations we investigated uh, went up quite a bit. Actually, even the, the money that we brought into the general fund from just the one year of more cremations would cover our current deficiency. Um, so uh, we ended up doing a lot of work with cremations. That I expect to, 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 go, to go down. Uh, but the homicides, the drug intoxication deaths, uh, suicides, you know, I can't, can't predict. Um, although with the drug intoxication deaths, we do see uh, for the past five or six years, this increase each year. So 
Uh, I, I don't see, unless we can get rid of fentanyl, uh, which I don't see happening, uh, those deaths are not going to, to decrease. Well, thank you uh, for that answer. And it kind of walked me into my second question because I highlighted in here cremation investigation. Can you help us understand what and how we investigate cremation? Sure, uh, that's something that's required by our statute that before anybody can be cremated, uh, the, the death has to be reported to our office and we have to do an investigation. And typically that involves reviewing the death certificate it may getting, include getting medical records or speaking to the family, but we want to make sure that there's not something untoward with this death. It's not a homicide or something like that. Uh, and, and so uh, we have to investigate those deaths uh, and then kind of sign off on them so they can uh, uh, undergo cremation. And then the, uh, there's a fee involved with that that goes to the state. All right, doctor. Thank you very much for your testimony. Madam Chair, thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Are there uh, uh, Representative Baker? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm Dr. Gill. It's good to see you. Um, a question for you in regards to if you can elaborate a little bit on um, as you were doing these COVID uh, uh, um, deaths and you, you had the, um, the part medical examiner has been. Um, 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 <clears throat> I, I know at one time you were doing a lot of swabbing of, of, of deceased persons to keep track. Um, is your um, tracking uh, um, analysis, uh, um, how is that uh, um, affecting the caseloads in terms of um, needing more personnel or is that an increase uh, what you're doing in the uh, medical examiner's office? Yeah, the, you know, during the more active part of uh, the COVID uh, deaths, we were doing a lot more funeral home uh, uh, investigations. We were going and doing swabbing of the seedings in funeral homes uh, uh, because there was a question of, of uh, a COVID death. Uh, we're seeing uh, um, some autopsies as well on suspected COVID deaths because there are instances where we may not be able to be sure, for example, a death at home, uh, if it's a COVID death or not. And so we need to do the autopsy in those. So that adds to our, uh, our numbers. Uh, but I think one of the, the big issues with the staffing is, uh, is the number of autopsies and the size of our facility. Um, and so we need to constantly keep doing the autopsies seven days a week in order to have enough space for the new remains to come in. Uh, if we don't do that, then we're really in, in a problem. So is that, uh, um, um, and this is from a second question, is that um, a reason for increase of, of, of staffing of needing a new doctor? Correct, both because of the number of increased autopsies uh, and again, to kind of help with our management of our facility even, we do, uh, uh, we do need that, uh, that other doctor, correct. Uh, this is Greg Tennant, I'd like to talk to Meryl Gay. Do you see um, in, the, in the future, in a year, uh, that you're going to need to do some added uh, um, procedures in terms of determining uh, um, complications to um, deceased persons with, with the COVID uh, uh, um, virus? Are you going to be doing any further investigation in, in your office? Yeah, you know, and we're anticipating now that um, you know there's a new uh, funeral assistance program available for families uh, from the federal government where they can get reimbursed up to nine thousand dollars for for burial expenses. That we may get uh, other uh, families coming forward asking, uh, you know, was this death that wasn't certified as a COVID a year ago? Uh, was it a COVID death? Um, uh, and so we're expecting to, to, to face some of those uh, increase. Uh, a potential increase in work. Mm. Madam Chair, I have one more question. Is that okay? Did you, did you, did you use up your two? Did you use up the, see, <laughs> trying to be, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, oh, yeah. quickly. <laughs> okay, so um, based on that, um, Dr. Gill, do you feel that, so that means that um, you're gonna need added uh, funds to um, to actually amend death certificates and, and come back in more of a caseload in the future? Correct, more investigative staff predominantly because they, they're the ones that are initially talking to the families and getting the records and, and helping with the death certificates. You know, EDRS, the electronic death registration system has started. It's in New London County and, and the state's working on, uh, you know, involving the whole state. 
And I think once that happens, that will be a help for funeral directors and for us uh, in, in making some efficiencies, but we're not there yet. Okay. Thank you for your answers, Dr. Gillen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, you're welcome. Um, I just, just quickly, uh, sir, you you need investigators to check on on the fraud that you that you're experiencing, or is this just to follow up to make sure um, all burials and cremations are within the guidelines of what you're expecting? Is that what it is? Uh, I missed the first part of the question. Sorry. The... You mentioned that you would you could use more investigators. What would the investigators be doing? So they, they're our front line. They're the ones that go to the scenes. Uh, and actually during COVID, we had to re kind of task them just to handle all the phone calls that we were getting about COVID deaths. Uh, and so we had to drop our, some of our scene investigations because of that. Uh, now we're back up to uh, full scene investigations, but uh, you know, they're, they're still, we're always kind of uh, on that borderline of, of, uh, uh, of staffing with, with the investigators because uh, the COVID most of the COVID deaths that we get are not autopsies. Most of them actually are investigative work, getting medical records, talking to, to doctors uh, and, and so forth. And that's where our investigators play a big role. Okay, okay, all right. Thank you. Um, Representative McCarty. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, welcome Dr. Gill. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony. And as I was going through it, I, I noticed and did a little calculation. It looks like your uh, office has really looked at over from 2017 to 2021, 6,000 new cases with the same staffing with 50 members. So really appreciate the good work that you are doing. Uh, my question, and you touched upon it, was to just explain a little to us about the electronic improvements. You started to speak to that a little bit in New London. Could you just give us a time frame for there and how you think that may assist you to some degree? Uh, I would appreciate that, thank you. Sure, yeah, that's something that the DPH, DPH is working on and they're rolling it out through the state. But you know, because there are so many different towns and cities, they have to train all of those town clerks. Uh, and so I, I think it's gonna be going over the next several months uh, to increase the expansion of that. Uh, but instead of having to fill out a paper death certificate in the funeral home to come and pick up that paper death certificate, it can all be done electronically. And, and most jurisdictions in the country already do it electronically. Uh, in addition, they can also request funeral, uh, uh, sorry, cremation requests through electronically and pay electronically. So then we don't have to bill funeral homes for cremations. Uh, so that's going to be an efficiency as well. Um, but if we have to amend a death certificate, change or update a death certificate, we can do it electronically. The family gets it faster. Uh, the Har Hartford Vital Records gets it faster. The federal government gets it faster. And so they can look at these big numbers of deaths and, and really make some public health decisions based on those numbers very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank, you. thank you very much for that extra information. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I believe that is it. Thank you, Dr. Gill. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have Commissioner Marianne Dalton Rittman from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Good afternoon, ma'am. Commissioner? Yes. Hi, good afternoon. I was just being connected in. Okay. Uh, but, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, Representative uh, Walker and Senator Osteen and distinguished members of the Appropriations Committee. I'm Miriam Dolphin Ritman, uh, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Um, and I believe I have members of my team here as well. Uh, I believe Nancy Navaretta, Deputy Commissioner, and I believe uh, Stephen DiPietro, his, uh, who is our uh, Chief Fiscal Officer. Um, I'm here today to provide uh, testimony on House Bill 6438. Uh, enact making deficiency appropriations for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. Um, the department has anticipated an overall deficiency of 6.4 million in professional services and workers' compensation accounts. Uh, House Bill 6438 identifies shortfalls in professional services account in the amount of 5.9 million. 
and discharge and diversion services uh, account in the amount of $3 million. Uh, on April 1st, 2021, the FAC committee authorized 10.8 million transfer from personal services and home and community-based waiver account to address, to address the entire shortfall uh, of 3 million in the discharge and diversion fund, uh, 5.6 million shortfall in other expenses, and 2.2 million in professional services account. Uh, despite the actions of FAC, uh, the department continues to require deficiency appropriation to cover shortfalls in two specific accounts. Uh, the remaining 3.7 million in professional services and 2.6 million in workers' compensation account. The professional services deficiency is largely due to the department's need to hire contracted doctors and nurses uh, to provide coverage in our inpatient facilities. Uh, and the workers' compensation claims uh, uh, claims deficiency is a result of a carry forward of about 1.2 million um, from fiscal year 2021, or excuse me, fiscal year 2020, uh, uh, and also claims trends, which are higher uh, than the amount budgeted. Um, the department is still managing uh, and monitoring the workers' compensation uh, trends and may need to refine our overall uh, uh, request before the bill is negotiated. Um, we'll work, work closely with OPM and also the committee uh, to do that work. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify uh, before you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, and actually, I see Mary Kate Mason is on as well for my team, so I just wanted to, to add that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Dillon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner, and thank you very much for your testimony. Um, we've discussed the issue of clinicians quite a bit, so I'll set that aside just for this moment, and I'd like to focus on workers' compensation. Okay. Uh, the, the issue of workers' comp uh, has come up repeatedly in a couple of bills, in a recent consultant's report, and people seem to kind of bring out their their agenda. You know, it's well go after the hospitals, or it's or it's cut the the compensation. I guess my concern is 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 your department or anyone else? Oh, and the other thing is switching administration. Um, but is anyone looking at injury prevention? That is. Um, looking at the patterns of injury, and I'm, I'm, there, I'm aware because this is not new ground that some of the claims are old and, and that, that there isn't much that can be done, but going forward from a management point of view, um, has there been a look at the types of injuries that are leading to claims and, uh, and potential strategies to prevent those injuries? No, I, I appreciate that question, Representative Dillon. Um, absolutely. You know, I would say this is something that we're looking at on an ongoing basis in terms of, you know, whenever there's a, um, an individual that's injured, um, we're often looking at sort of what happened in that situation. Um, are, there, are there ways that, uh, you know, to, to mitigate uh, instances like that moving forward? Um, I would say that's both a part of the, you know, in many ways, both a part of the, the clinical um, review of any instance, uh, you know, as well as, you know, the, um, the overall sort of organization planning, organizational planning related to safety um, within the sites. Um, we all, we are also often updating our training. Um, so the training uh, that staff go through related to our uh, clinical safety strategies. Um, recently, as a function of the pandemic, we put in new training um, where um, staff were using, the, the training team used actual scenarios, you know, with, with, with some tweaks, but uh, actual scenarios that occurred. Um, and then the trainers sort of went through different techniques. Um, and so for those that were taking the training, they were able to sort of look in and um, essentially view some of these, these uh, techniques live. Um, so that's ongoing work. Uh, the staff have to participate in, in sort of routine training. Um, and often in those trainings, we use actual scenarios. 
Um, so, so yes, I would say it's something that we're looking at on an ongoing basis, both from a clinical perspective, um, but from a training perspective, uh, and also in terms of just our milieu management and, and how we can continue to keep uh, the clinical milieu and, and the units uh, safe for both patients and staff. Thank you. And, and a follow-up on that, um, is there an effort throughout your agency or actually statewide to, to look at post-injury support? I know in the private sector in the 90s, um, there was a lot of, a lot of discussion and, and about um, making phone calls to people after they were injured because it's a, it's, a, it's a debilitating thing to feel isolated and to have pain and, and uh, to make them to con continue the relationship with our employees when they are out and to see if there are other needs that we can feel to keep them sort of a part of the community. Do we make routine phone calls or, or provide ongoing post-injury support? Yeah, now I appreciate that question. So yeah, you know, my understanding is that often HR is in connection and in contact with people um, throughout the time that they're out. Um, and I think those, those contacts, from what I've heard and my understanding is it can include a range of things. You know, a person may be scheduled to come back, um, but maybe either because of their treatment or because of just where they are in whatever their recovery process is. Uh, you know, often there's a discussion with HR uh, around where the person is in their recovery um, and, and HR will, um, you know, will, will sort of remain connected and, and if necessary counsel the individual or connect them to other services and supports. Um, we know that you know, we often will routinely um, offer EAP to individuals. Um, that's an ongoing support. So individuals that are out on workers' compensation certainly are still eligible for EAP services and supports. So that's one, um, you know, one support that's available for folks. Um, but HR is, is just part of the process uh, mm -hmm. is often in contact with individuals, uh, you know, throughout the process, particularly around the time when they're supposed to be uh, returning. Great, and, and I wasn't suggesting that anyone try to interfere in the clinical relationship, but, but simply to make sure that people don't feel abandoned. It's very depressing to, yeah. be, to be injured and isolated. So I mm -hmm. really appreciate your, your, your response and thank you very much for your time. You're you're Thank welcome. you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Representative Bitts. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and not only for the testimony, but for the hard work everybody in your uh, staff have been doing during this really stressful time. Although you don't look particularly stressed. And I was wondering if you were in Connecticut or somewhere else. But that COVID has really, uh, really hurt a lot of people. And I was on a hospital board, and I don't know if there's a correlation between this and your state agency, but I was on a hospital board, and we found out a lot of people, a lot of employees had um, injuries that could have been prevented, but it took a long time to come to that, that uh, identification. And once they did that, they went to the hospital, to the nursing homes, and it didn't make any difference whether you were a janitor, a nurse, a doctor, whatever. It was an intensive year-long training on uh, an education on how to prevent things from happening. And once everybody understood that, there was a significant drop in, uh, in employee claims, not just for that one year, but for the next five years. Has the agency ever considered undertaking something like that, or is it does not apply to your uh, agency at all in the, in the employees you have in the mental health field? You know, I mean, I, I would say that that absolutely does apply. Uh, you know, we, we have not recently anyway, I think perhaps in the past, um, done that type of work with a contractor. Um, so with an outside entity. Um, but I would say we, we do do that type of work with our staff as part of a post-incident review. Um, so often if there is a, a scenario that happens on the unit, whether it be a um, you know, a person has to be um, put in restraint or, you know, or there's an injury. 
um, you know, to the extent that we have video footage, we'll often use the video footage um, as a teaching tool. Um, and, and that was one thing that we talked with staff about quite a bit during the, um, you know, once we separated the hospitals, that to the extent that we have video and we can use it um, as a teaching tool, we want to do that. We don't want it to be, you know, just, you know, initially there, there were concerns like, are, are the videos, is this a gotcha mechanism or, um, and some of our narrative and, and some of the goal has been, no, not, not absolutely not. It, it's really to be able to um, use it as a teaching tool. In, and in many instances we do, we'll do a critical incident or an incident review um, to be able to better understand sort of the processes. And so um, I think we do some of that, you know, that you mentioned representative events as part of our, um, you know, incident review process. Uh, and often that, that sort of debrief happens with the full staff um, that were involved in that. So if a code is called, you know, the, the debrief uh, is often with the, the staff and the team that were specifically involved in that. Um, and the goal is to be able to draw out lessons learned. Well, um, that's good to know because uh, one of the things I thought that was unique about what the hospital did is they did everybody. Mm -hmm. So everybody understood the value and importance of being proactive to prevent any type of injury. And then at the end of the year, you could say, well, last year, you know, we had 50. Mm -hmm. This year, because everybody, and I mean everybody, uh, understood the need and participated, we now only have like 29, and you continue to work your way down, but it's not just the staff with the patients, it's everybody, whether they're in the kitchen, whether they're in the, on the ground or walking around, and I just didn't know if that would, I mean, I'm sure it requires a major effort, but once everybody understands that that's a very, very important priority, uh, maybe we'll have less claims and people will feel that the state is in fact looking out for the best interest in trying to make sure they're, they're working in the best possible safe environment. So yeah. thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Um, and I guess you did a great job. So commissioner, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Okay. Uh, next, we have um, Commissioner Kiros from the Department of Corrections. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Senator Austin, Representative Walker, Representative Candelera, and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is Angel Kiros, Commissioner of the Department of Corrections. I'm here today to speak on our pro on a projected deficit and our appropriation status for the current fiscal year. OPM currently has projected a shortfall for the Department of Correction of 3.65 million dollars with 2 million projected in personal services and 2 million uh, in inmate um, medical services. The agency deficits in personal service and inmate services are offset by a surplus of $350 in the Board of Pardons and Parole account due to vacancies. We have made every effort to work within the budget allotment to the agency. However, responding to the pandemic while maintaining the integrity of our mission and safety and security of our staff and facilities have proven to be challenging. These deficiencies in the agency is currently experiencing in this personal service and inmate um, medical service account are being driven by higher than budgeted and anticipated overtime primarily due to the demand of the pandemic. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today and uh, we'll be happy to respond to any of your questions. Thank you, sir. And thank you for your testimony. Um, are there any questions for the Department of Corrections? Any questions? Uh, Representative Austin. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, Commissioner, for coming. When you talk about the inmate medical, are you having a hard time hiring uh, uh, medical staff in all job classifications or just in nursing? So the answer is uh, the primary, we, we are still experiencing a difficult time hiring nurses. Um, nurses uh, uh, are a challenge for the agency. As um, Secretary McCall, um, testify earlier, we are in constant conversation and work with OPM. Um, the salaries, the starting salaries are not competitive uh, um, with these, in, in particular with the nurses. And just to give you an idea um, of 
what we've done since 2019 when we took over, I mean, we've hired uh, a total, uh, so as of today, we got 629 uh, health service employees. We've had since um, January 2019 to current 151 volunteer uh, termination. They left the agency. We have 22 termination. We investigated it and we took discipline and uh, we departed with the individuals. We've hired um, 240 uh, uh, medical staff members at that time frame. 218 have transferred to other um, state agency and 96 have been promoted within the ranks. So it's not just the um, hiring uh, uh, um, of nurses, it's the retention of, of the staff that are transferring to other agency and then cope with the retirements. As I'm looking at the health service retirement with the um, 20, 22, um, I have 58 uh, um, health service staff that are eligible for retirement. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Um, I just want to go back to my my question and say, is it is your hiring relative to just nursing staff, or are there other medical staff that you're having a hard time firing? Uh, hiring, not firing. Primary. Sorry, primary. Freudian slip. <laughs> yeah, the primary will be nurses. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you, thank you, um, thank you, Madam. Uh, Let's see, uh, Representative Nolan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, you might have just answered my question with your last um, couple of statements, but I'm just, um, your overtime, uh, is, is it exceeding in, is exceeding in which area? Is that the nursing staff or is that other areas in the, in the hospital? It's on both, it's on the correctional officer size and the health service unit. And it's all related to the COVID. Well, and so it's it's a shortage of those positions that's creating that. Is that what you're saying? No, it's additional duties uh, uh, um, that the correctional officers in the health service unit um, have taken uh, when uh, combating the uh, uh, COVID-19. Um, all 14 correctional facility had to implement uh, uh, um, quarantine units for asymptomatic quarantine units for individuals coming out uh, um, from the streets and intake. And then our medical isolation require uh, additional staffing and particularly the nurses to go around and do their vital checks and uh, provide a medical service to these individuals. So the whole totality, the whole operational piece when it comes to COVID-19 is what's driving the, uh, the overtime. That's, that's because of the creation of these new duties? Just the creation of the new duties. In addition, um, the state allowed it, uh, each staff member, I believe the first time around in the first wave back in uh, March, 2020, was 10 or 14 COVID days. And then on the second time in October, uh, state employees got additional, uh, I believe 10 or 14 days. So as of today, I've had over 222,000 hours of COVID leave from my staff. And those are 222,000 hours that I have to hire either a nurse or a correctional officer or supervisor to fill in the post at time and a half. So uh, uh, um, not it's just additional duties, but then also um, people calling out sick because of COVID and using their sick leave because of, of, of they either tested positive for COVID or in contact with somebody uh, um, that had COVID, had a quarantine for 14 days. Some of it's for daycare uh, 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 issues related to uh, um, COVID. So staff has, staff has utilized those 24 days that were given uh, um, to them. Okay, it, now are, is that, actually I just, I, asked, I answered my two questions, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, thank you, I, I'm good. You can, you can slide one more in, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was just wondering if, uh, in regards to the, the hiring of staff to cover those positions, is that something that has been considered uh, and, and how many would that be specifically, do we know? When hiring a staff, you are you referring to Representative Nolan? The, to cover the overtime for those duties uh, so that it's not time and a half, it becomes just regular time. So there were always uh, um, representative Nolan. Right now we're at 91, now we're at about 87 uh, capacity when it comes to staffing levels. However, every time a staff member should not report to work, whether sick, 
vacation, uh, personal leave, medical leave, military leave. Uh, okay. That's always going to be a, a, um, overtime. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I mean, Senator Winfield. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Representative Nolan pretty much went down the, the path, but I guess I, I, I just want to be clear what you're saying. So um, the increased demand is, is due to COVID or is that just part of what the increased demand is? And if so, what is, the, what is driving the, uh, or what drove the other increase in demand? So I'm going to say it's totally COVID. Uh, uh, it's not just a treatment of the uh, uh, individuals uh, with the nursing staff and with the correctional staff that are manning these housing units. If you can remember early on, we opened up three housing units up at Northern with a medical isolation unit. And uh, those, were, those units were ran with additional staff that uh, with our correctional emergency response team. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, 222,000 hours of COVID sick time since March 2020. Uh, uh, um, so even if I was uh, at 100% capacity because of COVID and the operation of COVID and the treatment uh, that we had to provide to individuals, uh, uh, the overtime was going to uh, um, skyrocket. I don't. I, I would think that would be here with a lesser deficit, but still with a deficit because of COVID. You have to understand too, we've had probably uh, um, close to 300 uh, a medical outside hospital trip since of March due to COVID that were on uh, uh, unscheduled. Uh, and those are at minimum two officers um, leaving per trip. Uh, um, so uh, um, I would say uh, Senator Winfield is strictly a, 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 a COVID related. And we were projected, we were on track to, and for FY20 to come in 5% under the overtime hours that we utilize in FY19. So we were on track to meet that 5% reduction, which was we testified that if you get us at 91%, that we would be able to meet that. And uh, we were on track to March 2020 when COVID hit. Okay. Um, is there, is it, I don't know what form you have this in, but is there a way to see um, how this actually works in terms of your numbers, in terms of a breakdown of, um, who is what the assignments are to correlate to this increase and um, as well as the, the numbers you're talking about in terms of leave. Uh, I'm just interested to, to actually see what really took place and, and how many people and just get a better sense. As you know, I've been trying to figure out what we've actually done in this system uh, over the course of the entire um, pandemic. So that would just be very helpful to me. Actually, I got it in front of me. So what I'll do, I'll um, put in a PDF file and I'll send it to your um, to your email. Okay, thank you. And I'll share that to the chairs of the committee too. Yeah, I was going to ask. Could you send it to Sue King so that she can share it with everybody? Thank you. Um, is that all, Senator Winfield? Yeah, that's all. I got kids. I'm trying to <laughs> delimit the background noise. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, no more questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, the uh, Department of Administrative Services, uh, David Peja. Maybe. There we go. We threw the staff a curveball, Representative Walker, so they've got to let the DAS folks in. Okay. All right. No problem. Is there testimony from DAS? Uh, I didn't see it online. I'm sorry if I missed it. It would be in the in the public hearing if it's if it's there. Uh, uh, I don't see any testimony from them. No, ma'am. Yeah, I didn't see it in the public folder. Thank mm -hmm. you. There is testimony. It came in late. Um, we'll get it up right now. Okay, thank you. Can I begin? Um, yes, yes, go right ahead, sir. Go right ahead. Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, good afternoon, Representative Walker, Senator Osteen, Representative France, 
Senator Miner and members of the Appropriations Committee. My name is David Pajak. I am the Director of Insurance and Risk Management within the Department of Administrative Services. Uh, I provide support to the State Insurance Risk Management Board. And I've been the Director of Insurance and Risk Management since January 15th of this year. So this is my very first testimony. Um, I did want to let you know that Commissioner Jabal wanted to be here, but, uh, but he could not. I want to thank you for today and giving us the opportunity to provide you with uh, testimony in support of House Bill 6438, an act making deficiency appropriations for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021 and the deficiency appropriations to DAS. Um, I'm here to request your support. Uh, specifically, DAS is in need of $1 million of additional funds from the Special Transportation Fund for the State Insurance and Risk Management Board's operations. Now, there are three reasons for this deficiency. Uh, first, there was an unanticipated premium increase in bus liability insurance policy. The second reason was there was an anticip unanticipated premium increase and the Connecticut Rail Liability Insurance Policy, which renews on May 1st of this year. And the third reason was that there were several large bus liability claim settlements that were outside the board's uh, standard projections and its forecast. Um, so that's what I uh, have here in front of you. Uh, I wanna thank you all very much for your consideration. And besides myself, uh, Jolita Lazarskis and Chantel Vars from the Department of Administrative Services Business Office, and uh, Fred Tangaway, who is from Assured Partners. Uh, Assured Partners is the state's insurance agent of record, and we are here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Pajak. Are there any questions? Uh, Representative Datham, two questions, please. Thank you for the reminder, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Hi, hello, David. Thank you for presenting. Um, I don't have your um, your testimony yet. Um, I'm just wondering, could you, was, it, you said it was bus coverage? Um, yeah, bus liability insurance policy, yes. So it's, yeah, liability rather than medical or, or anything. Do you, um, in terms, are these self-insured plans or how are they, how Sure. Uh, the bus liability insurance policy it, it, it is part of an excess liability policy, and the state assumes the first $4 million per accident in what's called a self-insured retention. And then we have various layers of liability coverage above there. Okay, that's two questions, so I'll wait and come back for my next one. Okay, uh, Representative Dillon. Thank you very much, um, Senator Austin. Uh, the, um, um, how do you do, Mr. Pajak? Um, uh, are you you're new to that position? Yes, I am, January 15th. Okay. Um, and uh, without your testimony, obviously, we're, we're kind of listening very carefully to how you speak, or at least I was. Uh, I wonder if you could provide us with a breakout uh, the, of the components, uh, if other people had it before them, since I asked you the question, um, I would just like to know how much um, of the, how the how the individual dollars uh, add up. Sure, um, I can add to um, the Connecticut Rail Liability Insurance Policy, and I know Mr. Tangway and and uh, Jolita and Chantel can add to the others. The, the Connecticut Rail Policy had uh, a budget of uh, $1.7 million and the premium this year um, that uh, needs to be renewed with policy on May 1st was 2,190. So you have about $400,000 right there. Um, Fred, can you um, talk about yes. the liability insurance policy and the claims? Yes, the, so the deficiency can be split out by uh, the CT rail policy being $400,000 over, over budget, over projected budget. The um, excess uh, bus policy being $200,000 um, over budget. 
um, and the um, unanticipated large bus claims being about $400,000. So that should total up about a million dollars, which 60% of it is coming from um, insurance premium renewal increases and the remaining is from claims. All set, Representative Dillon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If I could ask a second question. The a number of, of new functions or, or new responsibilities have migrated to your department. Uh, do you anticipate any uh, potential issues with managing other functions in other departments going forward? Well, I can tell you that um, in my three months that I've been at the state, um, one of the functions was to listen and learn and understand the state's risk profile and understand the you know, roles and responsibilities of the state insurance risk management board. So I can tell you that um, I am keeping my eyes out in the open and, and listening well. Um, I think what we always wanna do is find the best coverage for the best pricing. and. And the fact is that we're always, you know, looking to manage risk the best we can with all the stakeholders. Um, so as I progress through my journey in the in the state government, um, I'm, I'm looking to manage that risk. All set, Representative Madam, Dillman. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Representative Wilson. We can't hear you, Representative Wilson. Now we can hear you, whatever you just did, I think. Try talking. No, we can't hear you. You can't, we can't hear you. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. It could be that your um, uh, your microphone is on another um, in another area on another meeting or something. We almost heard you a second ago. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, Representative Datham for a second time. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to understand um, claims uh, in uh, the department that's causing the deficiency this year over previous years. Do we have any uh, analysis that's been done to um, show claims? I, I know a lot of other liability um, outside of COVID seems to be lower um, as a result of COVID and less driving and, you know, less business operations and, and buildings and things. So I'm just kind of curious um, what uh, may be attributing to the uh, excess claims this year compared to others. Fred, Fred can you answer that question? Because I don't know the specifics, but um, I can tell you that you know, these were uh, settlements, not jury verdicts that were, uh, you know, driving the claims monies to be spent. These types of claims are, are, are they, they are resulting from um, accidents involving uh, state owned buses. So they're either passengers on buses or they could be pedestrians and crosswalks or, or if they could be a, um, an individual in a private passenger car that is hit by a bus. Um, these larger claims that have been resolved this year uh, are several years old. Um, so um, pretty much most of these claims, three, four, five years old, they've gone through the whole discovery process and they were ripe for settlement this particular year. So this, you, you can't look at, these are not necessarily COVID related, nor are they necessarily uh, related to there's less passengers on buses. So if you do less claims because these are lagging behind and this is when, this is all pre-COVID uh, type of claims. 
That makes sense. Thank you for explaining that. Um, sorry, I wasn't kind of thinking all of that stuff through. That's really helpful. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, Representative Wilson, did you fix your issue there relative to speaking? You can, it's saying it's connecting to audio. I don't know what to tell you. Now try. Testing one, two. There you go. You're there. Whoa. I don't know. I, got this, your I, got this thing in this, I have this thing on the screen that says leave computer audio <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to press it. Um, so, Mr. Director, thank you. Um, my question um, when I hear about the premium increases are, are these policies um, experience rated? Well, I can tell you that um, with the Connecticut rail policy is these are uh, a lot of Lloyd's of London policies in other markets and they're layered. Um, so they're, they're very much, you know, we're part of a pool um, I'm sure when they look at the uh, retention that the policy has, which I believe is, is a million and Fred, correct me if I'm wrong, um, th that goes into play with the experience, but a, a lot of it's pooled approach and looking at some of the, uh, you know, the market bearing catastrophic potential losses on, on how they underwrite this. Because this is a very specialty market uh, with the Connecticut Rail considering the catastrophic potential losses. So, well, no, but if I might add, the, the definition of experience rated is very, very broad. So these these particular policies are not are not rated specifically and solely on its own claim experience. It's part of the overall umbrella and excess marketplace. The 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 um, insurance market for excess insurance, which is what we're talking about here, has, is extremely challenging and has hardened over the last two years. It's very difficult to see double digit increases across the board if you have, even if you don't have any claims against your policy. Um, so yes, there's an experience rating component to it. Um, that being if, if you're having claims, the premiums will go up, but if you're not having claims then that has taken into account, but it is not rated solely on its own experience. I, I got it. So in other words, if you're in the pool and somebody else in the pool has claims then your rate goes up. That, that's right. and that's the concept of insurance. Yes, <laughs> right. So, so I guess then the next question is: How often do we um, go out for a request for a proposal on this, or is there just such a uh, kind of a small arena of players that uh, issue these types of policies? Well, I'll go first. Um, first of all, um, Assured Partners goes out to bid every every year for this because of the type of specialty. And you have almost 20 markets that are layering this uh, $348 million uh, limit that we have. And so it's a type of market that there's a lot of restrictive underwriting in this sort of uh, risk. So, you know, Fred and his staff do a, a lot of due diligence and, and a, long, a, a long time and negotiating because uh, some of the questions that come back from the underwriters are, are very specific considering the catastrophic nature potential of this, of this type of uh, policy. Um, the one thing I, I did wanna let everyone know is that the, the overall premium increase was, you know, from last year was 19%, but the rate per million was up about 9.7% and that's below a lot of benchmarking that we've done. So um, we're, we're pleased with their results. Uh, we wish they can be less, um, but they came out at, uh, at, at, at the number that we have and therefore the deficiency. If, if I might add, a, an insurance policy is a contract. At the conclusion of every contract, we re-up the contract. So we go out to bid every single year on every single policy for the state. All right. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that is our last person. Representative Walker, do you want to end the meeting now? Um, are, 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 we, are we done? Because the other one was in another meeting and they were going to try and get to us, Yukon, but I guess not. I will ask uh, Madam Administrator, did they come? 
They're okay. in the waiting room, Madam Chair. Are they? So I can let them in. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. We had to skip. They, had, they were testifying in front of um, finance. So they asked if they could come <laughs> after everybody else. Yes, hello. Uh, good, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So could, should I go ahead, Representative yeah. Walker? Absolutely, absolutely. Go right ahead. So um, I'll try and keep my comments brief because I know, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for your indulgence and in allowing us to come in at this point. Um, we were on the bonding and finance uh, revenue subcommittee. Um, so thank you, uh, Representative Walker, Senator Austin, and ranking members and committee members for hearing us today. I'm Dr. Andrew Aguinobi. Everyone just called me Andy or Dr. Andy. I'm the Chief Executive Officer uh, of Yukon Health, and joining me today is Jeff Gagan, who is the Chief Financial Officer, and we want to really thank you for the opportunity to discuss uh, with you about our strong support for um, HB 6438, um, uh, an act making deficiency appropriations for the fiscal year ending June 30, 2021. I do want to pause here, and I'll explain a little bit later, that um, we're very supportive of this bill, but it does still, from a deficiency standpoint, we will still be short uh, by about $22 million because of last year's uh, fiscal 20s uh, COVID-19 uh, deficiency. Um, I'll just say in, in summary, before I talk about the dollars, that um, everyone can be very proud of, as, as we are, of your public, the only public academic health system in the state. Uh, from a medical school perspective, um, I've mentioned in several meetings that 37% uh, of our graduates from the, from the medical school uh, practice in the state, which makes the medical school the single largest provider of medical doctors in the state of Connecticut. Uh, same thing for the dental school, 47% of the School of Dental Medicine graduates uh, practice in the state. So that's the largest provider of dental professionals. And an interesting statistic is that the first year classes for both dental and medical school, the, the medical school, 73% of the medical school students are from Connecticut, the residents of the state of Connecticut, citizens. And 48% of the School of Dental Medicine are people that live in, in Connecticut. So uh, there's a lot to be proud of. Research is growing. We have this TIPS program, which has over 40 incubator biotech companies that have been brought to uh, Connecticut with over $400 million in funding that they've drawn down to Connecticut. Um, and then on the clinical enterprise, um, we're really proud of the fact that this is, when you talk about access to public health in Connecticut, for all 169 towns, we have the data that shows that we have hundreds and thousands of people that come from all 169 towns to Yukon Health in Farmington because a, a lot of the reason is that if you're underinsured and that includes Medicaid and you need specialty care, this is where you, 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 you can get cutting edge care, uh, no questions asked uh, in terms of, you know, we take you whether you have Medicaid or whether you have commercial insurance and we give you the best care. So. So there's a lot for you to be proud of. From a financial standpoint, just getting to, to the point, um, we, uh, in fiscal year uh, 20, as you know, we had the pandemic, which we've responded to. I think all the people here have really responded to in an amazing way. Every hospital in Connecticut had deficits, significant deficits due to COVID-19. In fact, at one point, we were losing a million dollars a day in the, mid in the middle of the pan pandemic. But luckily, uh, well, what happened is at the end of fiscal year 20, we had a, we actually had a deficit. We were projecting a deficit of 57 million in losses, but we were able to work that down through capital spending reduction, through some federal funds and some operating uh, mitigation. We were able to get fiscal year 20's number down to a deficit of 18.9 million. In fiscal year 21 that we're talking about now, we had an all, a, a whole new deficit projected based on the uh, COVID-19 surge that we knew we were going to have. And that was a very big number. It was, uh, it was comprised of uh, over 61 million, we've submitted this in testimony, over $61 million 
for COVID-related losses, and then $53.8 million for unfunded legacy costs. The good news is that we were able to, to mitigate the 61 million due to COVID losses uh, with a combination of um, capital deferrals, deferring capital, uh, management furloughs, some federal funds of about 18 million, and then our own internal financial improvement plan, which was reduction of expenses and increase of revenues through clinical care. Um, we were able to kind of take that 61 million off the table, which, did, which still left us with the 53.8 million in uh, unfunded legacy costs as a deficit. So the bottom line for us is that we are extremely thankful to the governor and to Senator McCaw and everyone for, for putting uh, $50 million in the governor's budget. Um, and, we, and that is going to be immensely helpful. It does leave us short uh, about 22 million because it's to be applied across two years, including fiscal year 20. Um, but um, our hope is that we'll be able to address that as well. So I'll just stop there and um, in the interest of time, I'll just take any questions you might have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you, sir. Um, so the, the $50 million that you were, you said the governor is putting into the budget. I'm sorry, where did he put, I didn't hear where he, where he put that in. Uh, yeah, um, I will, uh, so, so that, is, that is in the uh, deficiency, but Jeff, do you wanna mention where that is exactly? It's, it's not in the budget, um, the $50 million was the proposal for this deficiency bill. Yeah, but, sorry, I, miss, I misspoke. So, so okay. it's the proposal so for this, the this, this, it's the proposal for this deficiency bill. Thank you. The, the, the proposal he, he recommended, but I mean, he, he acknowledged it with you, but he didn't put it into the budget, did he? Into the deficiency bill, did he? Uh, Maureen, do you want to say something? Uh, we have our government relations person here. Maureen? Sure, hi. Oh, I've Hello, heard Representative. Of, I've heard of her. Hi, hi Maureen. Uh, so, yes, the governor put $50 million in this deficiency bill for fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21 issues. Okay. But it is short by $22 million. Okay, all right. So he did, he did put $50 million in. Yeah, I just found it. Okay. Okay. All right, and, and you're still short 22 million. Correct. Hmm. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Thank you. Uh, questions from the members. Huh. Awesome. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Somebody's. <laughs> My friend. <laughs> she don't ever play Jeopardy, okay, Representative? I know I'm always last to hit that button. Um, I I just wondered if we could hear a little more about the additional 22 million uh, that we're still going to be deficient at the university and how that will be addressed. Um, you you alluded to it in your remarks, so I just like a little more explanation. Thank you. Yes. So so for fiscal year 21. Um, we have a remaining, we've mitigated 61 million, the, the, the losses due to COVID, but, it, but we have the remaining 53.8 million, which is our allocation due to unfunded legacy costs. So the governor in this deficiency bill put in 50 million, which under normal circumstances would be great, right? Um, because it's 53.8 and 50. But the problem is that that 50 has to be applied to two years, not just fiscal year 21, but fiscal year 20, uh, where we had a COVID-19 related deficit of 18.9 million. So if you, if you take the 50 and you apply some to the 18.9 million, it leaves 31 million for this year, which leaves us short by 22 million. That, that that helps explain it because you're actually dividing the uh, cost there. Okay, thank thank you very much, Representative Walker. Thank you, Madam thank Chair. You, you got you, you got everybody else. Oh, you woke up everybody else. Okay, Representative Haddad. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair. Um, I I um I wanted to know how this relates in the subcommittee. We talked a little bit about the advanced payment that you got from the federal government for reimbursements 
um, I think that that was somewhere in the vicinity of your your fiscal year 20 deficit. Um, it, and, and so I want to know how that relates to the deficits that you're proposing that you're, you're projecting right now. Uh, that assumes I imagine that part of your deficit for the coming year uh, pays back that loan. It's essentially a loan, right? Yes. Yeah, so so you're referring to uh, thank you, Representative Haddad. You're referring to the Medicare advanced payment. Um, and just for everyone to know, and I'll turn it over to my CFO, um, to our CFO, that um, uh, all hospitals in the country were given the opportunity to ask Medicare for an advanced payment on, on, um, on accounts uh, receivable for the future. And, uh, and most people took advantage of that and we did too, but it's essentially a loan. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff to just say a, little, a few more details about that. And by the way, it did help us immensely with cash flow during this period of time. So go ahead, Jeff. Yes, and as Dr. Aguinobi just mentioned, the advance payment is a loan. Um, so the uh, loss or the balancing effect that we still have will continue. Uh, what that does is it gives us extra cash so we don't go negative. Um, we were projecting to actually go negative sometime in January or February. And once we received the additional cash from the federal government, um, we were able to continue operations without worrying about that um, uh, cash negative situation for Yukon Health. At this point, that cash is um, with us through next September. Starting next September, we will start the payback process. Um, they have been discussing that on the federal level, um, but it will, you know, um, the payback will start in next September and uh, the current point could go for a year or so before all of those funds are paid back. Um, but again, that, that's not permanent funding that helps us offset any of this deficit. It more keeps the um, cash balance positive as we work through it. Jeff, do you want to say how much it was? It was $45 million. And, and so the so the follow up question, I guess, is just that so the the deficits that you're uh, that are recovering in this deficiency bill or trying to cover in this deficiency, 18.9 for fiscal year 20 uh, and significant something close to 53 million for fiscal year 21. Do they um, are those are those are those numbers different because of the loan? Um, in, in other words, you know, is, is the 45 million um, uh, on uh, mitigating this number, or is it um, is it altering altering that number at all? That's what I'm trying to figure out. I understand. Is the forty five million dollars making a difference in the deficit that we, that that we're in the years that we're talking about? Thank you, Representative. No, the forty five million has no effect on those numbers. Um, from the federal side, again, we don't we don't bring it in as revenue or as income. Um, and then spend it back. We just had it as a loan to help our cash flow. Um, the only thing that we did bring in that does help it is in fiscal 20, we received about $18.1 million to help offset that 57 million loss. And in fiscal 21, we did receive about 18.7 million, which helped um, reduce the 61 million COVID loss that Dr. Agu Aguinobi spoke of. Um, but the current balances are, are those net deficits that we have, or that's you know, a better way to think of it. That's the cash shortfall that Yukon Health has seen in each year. Yeah. Re Representative, if I could just, uh, just because I know it's a lot of numbers we're throwing around. So if we put aside the Medicare loan, um, just for everyone, we put aside the Medicare loan because that's just a loan. Um, we did receive 18.1 million, as Jeff said, in federal funds. Um, and uh, that offset, we had very large losses in fiscal year 20, but that helped us off. We had about 57.4 million in projected losses for last year, but the federal funds of 18.1, along with capital spending reduction of about 10.9, and along with um, uh, operational financial improvement of about 9.5, we were able to bring that deficit down to 18.9 million for fiscal year 20. So that's what we were left with. And obviously because the legislature wasn't in session, we were unable to get that addressed. Um, and so we've carried it forward to today. Thank you for your answers.
Thank you. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, Representative France. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess one quick follow up on the $18.9 million deficiency. How is it that you were able to carry it forward now 10 months since you know, the state closes out its books three months after the fiscal year? What is different about your budgeting and your uh, fiscal state that allows you to carry forward a deficit out of the last fiscal year, you now almost 10 months into the next fiscal year? That's a, that's a great question, and it's something we had to work with uh, OPM on. So I'm going to ask Jeff to, to tell us uh, how, how we did that. Go ahead. So um, I, I will go on the technical side. Again, we get 23% of our operating support comes from the state. All of the rest of that is in a separate operating accounts that are managed by Yukon Health. Um, so basically that loss was carried just on the books that was on the non-state accounts. So we did close out last year's general fund, um, but the um, loss that was carried for in the operations was the part that we were trying to figure out how we could manage in fiscal year 21 until we got to this deficiency. Um, OPM actually had the great idea of the fiscal 21 operating support they basically gave us two quarters in the first quarter. So they gave us cash of two quarters, which meant then in March, we were gonna get zero of our, our cash from the general fund because we got two quarters and then one in one. Um, and then after that in July, as I was, um, was mentioned in September, we got additional that loan from the federal government of $45 million. So all of those actually supported the operations accounts of Yukon Health um, until we are, you know, right now asking for the deficiency for both fiscal year 20 and 21. Thank you, I appreciate that clarification. It was uh, trying to understand how it is that you could carry forward something for the last fiscal year this long um, and it helps understand both sides of your budget. The second question I've got is related to the capital deferrals and Many times we, we make these decisions and I understand why you did them to reduce the um, deficit that you're projecting in deficiency. But what, what is, have you looked at the projected cost? Because generally you have an escalation of anywhere from three to 5% per year deferring these decisions or were these cases where the capital expenditure was expected but the need for it wasn't there based on the condition of the equipment or whatever was being purchased. Uh, if you could clarify at a high level yes. for that decision process. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll say a few words and I'll let Jeff talk a little bit more technically about it. But bottom line is from a capital perspective, as you know, we have to buy equipment and we, you know, we hire people, they need operating microscopes and all types of things. And we have deferred maintenance on our buildings. So there's a certain amount of capital each year that needs to be expanded on our buildings uh, and our equipment. Um, what, since 2018, we have not had any capital allocation from the legislature um, as other agencies might have. But I do want to say that, that prior to that, we had Bioscience Connecticut, which there was a lot of capital put into our, our, our organization, which we're very thankful for. Um, so, so what we decided, because the state was having some difficulties and we were advised not to bring, uh, you know, uh, capital asks during the last three years, we actually haven't received anything since 2018. And in addition, as you mentioned, we've yeah. been reducing our capital to be able to balance the books uh, due to these issues that we've talked about. So what that has led to is, and I, I should mention that we have 1.6 billion uh, dollars worth of, of facilities here. So what that has led to is a deferred, deferred maintenance uh, challenge we have over the next 10 years. We got an independent company to, to kind of help us. And that's a deferred maintenance challenge of about uh, 320 million or so over the next 10 years. Uh, so in fact, the, the meeting that I was just on uh, recently um, that, that was on just during this meeting was to bring forward our capital ask, which is uh, the first time we've really asked for significant capital since 2018, of about 57 million for fiscal year 22 and, and uh, 23 million 
for fiscal year 23. Um, so I'll, I'll just stop there and see if Jeff, I wanna make sure we're answering the question directly. Jeff, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I would just add to the representative, you are 100% correct. Um, as we kick the can down the road or as we defer these projects, those, those prices do have an escalator in them. Um, and we have been seeing even, even lately in the past six months that the three to five uh, has been increasing, especially over the construction trades in some of the mechanical HVAC um, and things like that. So unfortunately, those might even, we might even see more of an increase as we're you know, in the marketplace with everybody else on those. But the deferred maintenance, um, as we keep on deferring those, it comes into the point where sometimes if it, there is an emergency or something, then we're forced into, you know, going, going just to see what those accelerated costs will be. I appreciate that. I, I understand it. You know, it's kind of the other, other side of the, uh, the budget predominantly, but certainly there's an intersection with your managing your operating budget using capital funds. So um, as you look forward and you just raise one of the concerns that comes with capital is, uh, an emergency that pops up, uh, which would have a, an impact on your operating costs because you would have to spend that today. Uh, have you looked at what mitigation there or strategy of what you anticipate are your you know, top three potentials where that might happen and, and what those look like? And I guess just instead of getting an answer, uh, if you could provide some kind of a report that kind of details that risk that you identified and how that might intersect with the uh, operational side of the budget, which is the purview of the Appropriations Committee. We will definitely do that. Representative. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Are there any other questions from any of the committee members? Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you. Great job. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that concludes the public hearing portion of the committee. Uh, thank you very much and uh, stay tuned for upcoming.